Okay. Dear colleagues, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you this webinar titled Advancing Leadership at European Level and Beyond by Women Rectors of Technical Universities. Title itself has a very special place in my heart as I am the first and only female rector of Istanbul Technical University in its 250 years of history. I served two terms between 1996 till 2004. At that time, as women academics, we thought that we have broken the barriers. But unfortunately, since 2004, we have not had another female rector at Istanbul Technical University. There is no women rector among the technical universities in Turkey at the moment. What we are going to share and discuss here should not make us pessimistic about the representation of women in STEM areas, as well as at top level of academia related to STEM areas. Instead, should give us more energy to remove the barriers and make the future much better for further female generations. Thanks to European Commission publishing the she figures since 2013. If you look at the last version that was published in 2021, we still observe very low representation of women at leading positions, not only in STEM areas, but also across almost in all disciplines. From 2015 to 2021, she figures the percentage of uh, full professors ratio across Europe increased from 21% to 26.2%. The same ratio is even more problematic in STEM areas for the same period. In science and engineering, the ratio of full professors increased from 13 to 15%. If we look at women heads across Europe, including technical universities in 2009, the ratio was 13%. It is increased and reached 23.7% in 2019. But this increase did not happen in technical universities. According to the 2021 she figures, Across Europe, only 18% of the including institutions focusing on science and engineering have female leaders. I have not the exact number at the moment, how many TUs have female leaders across Europe. We checked the European universities, those have a title of TU. We found some 12 technical universities with women rectors. We are trying to organize webinar series to learn from their experiences, why we have so small number of women rectors at technical universities. After having these webinars, we may organize ourselves to act as a kind of facilitator to address this issue by creating opportunities to make female candidates more visible to increase their chances to reach leadership positions. Of course, we should not forget the basic problems that naturally create these low representation of women leaders in technical universe, universities. That is the low representation of women at all levels of STEM areas. If we look at the higher education space in general, we can see that female students at undergraduate and master's degree levels are exceeding male students, but still we do not see any remarkable improvements at top level. So this is a kind of chicken and egg problem in a sense, but I think we are women, we never give up, we have to achieve what we deserve. Before I complete my introduction, I would like to share a very encouraging article with you that is titled Majority of Ivy Leagues Will Soon have women presidents by Felicia Commodore. 
recently published in the University World News Global Edition on 9th of April, 2023. The argument is, while women make up about 60% of undergraduate as well as master's and doctoral students in the US, only about 32% of presidents of American colleges and universities are women. I would like to share some of the conclusion, conclusions of this paper with you before I complete my introduction. What impact do women presidents have? First one, for colleges that have only ever had a man in the president's role, hiring their first women as president can signal that the institution embraces change and evolution. Second one, female presidents add to the diversity of the college presidency. They add different perspectives to conversations that shape practices and policies, both within their college and across higher education. Third one is organizational scholars and business leaders affirm that diversity strengthens the decisions made by organizations and contributes to innovative solutions. And lastly, having women at the helm of academic institutions shows other women who aspire to become college president that it is indeed possible. That's all from me now, dear colleagues. Let's move to give the floor to our distinguished chair and our distinguished speakers. Thank you. Good afternoon and uh, thank you very much. The words uh, first uh, warm greeting to all the participants and most especially to Evora's president, the remarkable Gulsum Saglamer, who's an inspiration to us all and has certainly paved the way to inspire women throughout uh, Europe, throughout the world, to take up the roles of presidents, to be willing to serve and to show precisely that it can be done. So we have a great leader and uh, in her spirit, uh, we believe uh, at Evora's board that these uh, um, uh, aware, uh, conscious aware, raise, uh, conscious uh, awareness um, uh, webinars are particularly important, not only for us to understand and analyze the data that are, that are available regarding the uh, experiences, um, the barriers, uh, the institutional cultures that continue to um, limit the access of women to the top echelons of uh, uh, university leadership. Certainly, um, as Colson was saying, a lot has uh, occurred and uh, over the past decades, but the change has not happened uh, fast enough. Um, and it is still uh, not enough when you look at the numbers of women uh, leading um, university institutions uh, in Europe and the United States. Uh, if you look to the global South, the problem is um, even uh, larger. Um, and but it is also uh, very clear that looking at the data, specifically the She Figures report, that the number of female uh, researchers is consistently rising on average on the EU 27 um, level in 2021, uh, over 48% of researchers in uh, the natural sciences in mathematics and STEM were women. Uh, but having said that, how that then seeps into uh, leadership roles, we are still um, faced with a, uh, an enormous, um, less legal and more uh, cultural uh, issue um, at most um, institutions. Um, the leaders that we have with us today to discuss their experiences um, are outstanding researchers, outstanding scientists, and uh, fantastic uh, uh, university leaders. I want to uh, very briefly 
uh, present the three speakers before giving them the floor. Uh, I start with uh, Professor Geraldine Pauch, um, the president of the uh, Technische Universität uh, in Berlin, TU Berlin. She uh, is also uh, currently the uh, speaker of the Berlin University Alliance, uh, the Alliance of Excellence of the Berlin Universities, FU Berlin, uh, Humboldt Berlin, uh, TU Berlin, and Charité, the um, um, Medical University of Berlin. Uh, she will be. Uh, sh she started her tenure as uh, speaker uh, for the alliance in 2022, and will continue uh, for the next two years. Um, she um, studied mathematics at the University of Bremen um, and completed her dissertation at Roche Diagnostics in Penzberg. Uh, she has a distinguished career as a researcher and lecture lecturer at the University of Heidelberg, um, and. Um, uh, she uh, took up um, an appointment as a um, um, full professor, the uh, um, uh, three professor of me medical biometry at the University Medical Center Hamburg Ippendorf in 2017. And six months later, um, she was invited to come uh, and to take a professorship at the Charité, the prestigious Charité in Berlin. Uh, she served there as director of the Institute of Biometry and Clinical Epidemiology, and uh, uh, as well as vice dean of education uh, between 2020 and 2022, the tough years of uh, the pandemic. Uh, and uh, she was elected president in April 2022. Our second speaker is the president elect of University College Dublin, Professor Orla Feely. Um, she is currently, but um, as I understand from May 1st, she will no longer be vice president, but president uh, of the of University College Dublin. Uh, currently, she is um, still in her role as vice president for research, innovation and impact. Um, and she is a professor of electronic engineering. Um, professor Feely holds a, a degree um, from the university from University College Dublin um, and MS and PhD degrees from the University of California Berkeley, uh, where um, her dissertation won the DJ Sackerson Memorial Prize for outstanding and innovative uh, research. Her research occurs in the area of nonlinear circuits and systems, and she has been awarded numerous research grants and prizes uh, from national and international uh, sources. She's also a member of uh, many uh, prestigious uh, academies in Ireland and um, uh, in uh, other countries uh, uh, outside her own country. She is a member um, of the Irish Academy of uh, Engineering, a member of the Royal Irish Academy. She served as president of Engineers Ireland, um, as chair of the Irish Research Council, um, and uh, has held numerous other, uh, other uh, appointments uh, linked to leadership, uh, advocacy, and planning of uh, research and research um, policies. The third speaker is Professor Zondan Feyiz, the uh, rector of Kadir Has University in Turkey. Uh, Professor um, Feyiz uh, graduated from the physics department of Istanbul University's uh, Faculty of Sciences. She completed a master's in physics at the University of Wisconsin and uh, holds a PhD uh, from the physics department of Kansas State University. Uh, she served uh, while she was doing her uh, PhD as a teaching assistant at Kansas State University. Um, and then um, she became a research assistant there, postdoctoral research uh, as well. Uh, she, in 2000, I understand she came back to Turkey and began her academic career as assistant professor at the Technical University. Uh, and she became a uh, an associate professor in 2006, and in 2011, uh, a full professor at Sabanchi University. Uh, she served as vice rector uh, of Sabanchi University um, in charge of education, international relations, individual and academic support um, from 2010 to 2018, 
And she was appointed uh, in 2018, specifically the, as the rector of Kadir Haas University. So the three speakers today are very prestigious academics. Without further ado, um, I would like to uh, give the floor to our speakers uh, and to start uh, by asking them to reflect on some of the questions that we have laid out for the seminar, namely starting with your experience um, and your career, your career path to becoming a, a rector, um, whether this was a sustained planned um, career development, uh, whether there were unexpected turns or surprises um, with the benefit of hindsight and from the privileged position you have now as leaders of your institutions, would have there been something you, have, you would have done differently? Professor Rauch. Thank you. I hope you can all hear me. <laughs> so um, thank you very much for the invitation, for the nice introduction. Um, for me, becoming a president was in a sense a special that um, uh, me for myself, I was thinking uh, a lot about going more into um, uh, educational management or politics uh, in the field of research. This, so this was a plan in my head, but indeed what, what I did, I just <laughs> applied, <laughs> I just applied when I read uh, the announce on President for TU Berlin. So this was not uh, somehow a predefined plan. And then indeed, I didn't even knew anybody from the TU Berlin when I applied. So it was just was really a free uh, try. And I said for myself that, I, well, of course, at the beginning, I didn't really thought that I will have uh, high chances, but for me, it was like I will try to make a good performance and uh, then people might know that I'm interested in such kind of positions. And um, as I'm um, an external or as I'm ex an external candidate and as um, nobody views me, is uh, there's in a way nothing to lose uh, because nobody would expect me to win. <laughs> so, um, and uh, well, in, in, a, in a sense, it was... It was a try, but uh, I also put very much efforts in. So uh, once um, I was nominated with two other, along with two other candidates, uh, among them the former president who uh, was still, who wanted to um, be again uh, do a next legislature. So there were two internal candidates. Um, uh, I, I knew that I have to, um, talk to many people from the TU Berlin to have, an, have a chance to get a vision on the problems and what the people are thinking about. And this was really nice because on the one hand, all the people I contacted, these were professors, but also students and um, academic staff, they uh, talked very freely with me. And I think that one, um, one uh, uh, point for me was that uh, with an external view, I uh, I didn't have this history in mind. So I just thought about it very freely, how uh, things could be done, or uh, that maybe I just looked at the people without knowing something about the people. So I just listened to them. And I think this was really an advantage. And, uh, and also like that the other two candidates maybe at the beginning didn't really thought that I had a chance. <laughs> So in, in this case, this was in in favor of mine. But of course, it also took a lot, uh, some courage to do it and to say, okay, let's give it a try. Um, uh, but I can say that I, I I really love it, and I had a I soon had the had um the uh, uh, had the um friendships and the uh, the solidarity of many students. So this was a big point for me as well. Um, and I could say that the whole election process was a little bit like an <laughs> internal revolution. So it certainly had several um, aspects. On the one hand, of course, uh, some people were um, uh, did elected my person. On the other hand, there were also people who uh, do want just something new, <laughs> uh, irrespective of, of the true person. So I think there are several things are coming together, but um, well, it was a very nice time. It was really um, intensive uh, times where I do this election process. So it took over half a year to talk with all these people and to prepare. And it was a very open election. So all the three candidates were in many formats all together, all three together. So um, we were, uh, we had a, some kind of a 
3L, which was uh, on the video, where we will all ask um, questions and had to compete uh, with each other in a direct um, competition. And um, this was a, a very nice experience. And um, yes, <laughs> so far. So good preparation, willingness to risk it mm -hmm. and to be able to, which is something that often limits women. And, you know, the willingness to really stand up and uh, go uh, for, for, uh, for an ambitious new, new, new position. So Professor Feely, your experience. Thank you, Isabel. Um, maybe if I go back to when I completed my PhD in Berkeley, um, I had two main paths open to me. One was to stay and work in Silicon Valley and there was so much exciting work going on there for electronic engineers at that time. But I wanted to come back to Ireland. This was the early 1990s when very exciting things were happening in Ireland. I knew I loved research. I loved teaching. And I, I knew that a career in higher education and research was the right one for me. So that is the path that I took. And I built my career in higher education, teaching engineering students, conducting engineering research and really enjoying it. And I expected I advanced up the academic ladder from associate professor, professor and so on. So I, I expected that that would be the nature of my career path. Then at one point, I was appointed to a national body, the Irish Research Council. And I really enjoyed that oversight of our national research system and contributing at that systems level. And then I was appointed chair of that group. Through that, then I was appointed to the advisory group in Brussels for the Marys Klodowska Curie actions. That's where I met Gulson. And then I was appointed chair of that group following Gulson. So I, I found without necessarily having planned it this way, I was taking on more and more system leadership roles and really enjoying them. And I found that maybe the same attributes that, that make me a good engineer or might make somebody a good scientist or mathematician, you know, the ability to understand systems, to understand numbers, to articulate arguments, to follow logic, you know, those were exactly the same skills that I found were necessary at that broader national system level. So having undertaken a lot of those jobs, I, when the, the role of vice president for research and innovation in University College Dublin came up nine years ago, I said, boy, I would love to take that job on. So I did take it on. Um, it was a little bit daunting at first, uh, but I, I rapidly settled in and, and really enjoyed the job. And we've seen really measurable success for University College Dublin in this area over the past nine years. And then somewhat similarly, when the role of the president became vacant, again, I said, look, I know how to do this. I'd taken on other leadership roles in between then. I've been president of Engineers Ireland, our national representative body, vice president for CESAR, or one of our international organizations. So, you know, I had accumulated a skill set that I felt was the right one to set me up for leadership. And then I was delighted to come through what was a very difficult and rigorous interview process to be appointed president. And as you said, I will start on the 1st of May. So, so looking back, it was a succession of pursuing opportunities without a really clear plan, but opportunities, all of which really interested me at the time. And I think that is one of the great advantages of the academic life, that you have the opportunity to take on jobs beside your normal job. A door opens, you can push it open a little bit and peer in and step in and decide, yes, this is for me. Or if it is not for you, then you can retreat back to your core academic activities. So in my case, it was those other jobs that took me along a path that was not the one I originally planned, but one which I am finding enormously rewarding. So that, that's my journey. It's a wonderful journey, and it's going to be even more wonderful as from May 1st uh, onwards. Um, and I want to stress what you just mentioned about the opportunities, and it's an area where both researchers' experience and the way in which we are trained to select, make the necessary selections with the good data available and looking at the opportunity and seizing it. I think it's, it's uh, uh, one of the points that I really wanted to enhance from, from your experience and your contribution. Professor Fees. 
Okay, thank you, Isabel. You know, as Ola and Gawad said, you know, I never had a clear plan to become a rector of a university. You know, as a young scientist, my only dream was to become a really good scientist, to train the young scientists to become, again, better than me or better than the others. But along the way, I got to offer. I mean, that's, you know, when I got to offer my first spot as the vice rector, I said, are you sure you, you wanna work with me as vice rector? Because I didn't have any experience. As I said, I never had the goal to become an administrative faculty member. And you know, the answer the, the president gave me was really amazing. You know, if you are managing the PhD students and the master's students, and since you are a good scientist, you deal with the numbers, you can manage anything you want. That was the answer I got. And I said, okay, I'm going to be become the vice president. And I switched to uh, Sabanji University. And I stayed there for eight years as the vice president. And, and then, you know, once you gain the experience, because we are good scientists. If you are a good scientist, then you are a very good observer. Then you see what is working and what is not working in the system. Because we are scientists, we come up with the solutions. And now you have everything in front of you. And then you say, it is time to be a rector in any university so that you can implement whatever solution you have in your mind. And the, the, the question that what I would do differently along the path, the following, you know, when I become vice rector of Sabanji University, I was the first vice rector of this university because it was newly founded university. They didn't have vice rector. The only thing they had the vice the director. So it wasn't defined. I didn't know what for I was responsible. I was, I had the title, but no responsibility. It took five years to define my responsibility as the Vice Director responsible for education, responsible for international relations, and responsible for individual development. And if you know, I was it were man, I'm sure from the beginning it would say, "Hey, if I have the position, give me the definition." That I would for sure do different five years ago. So now I am director, and this is you know, as Orla said, yes. There is an opportunities. You open the door, believe in yourself, and you will find a solution for whatever problem you are facing. And that is the path that takes you to the presidency or rector of a university. Uh, what you were saying, um, Sundan, about the crux between being a scientist yeah. and the vocation for science and managing the system. Uh, you're often faced you're at that crossroads of making a decision where uh, will I have to give away one or the other to pursue how, how, how will I shape my career moving forward. I remember when I became vice rector for research, a, a colleague, an American colleague called me up and said, you can't do this. This is the kiss of death for an academic. <laughs> but it's not because I want to stress it as as. Um, Orla was saying it is important to shape uh, a system, to be able to contribute to shaping a system that is demanding, that is excellent to continue to pursue excellent science, uh, contribute for that advancement while empowering diverse uh, uh, researchers, a set of diverse researchers to pursue their goals. Uh, but this is still very much at times in uh, the minds of our colleagues when it comes to making a, a, a decision. Now, in your institutional roles now, the question is, how, where do you see, how do you see your contribution now as leader of your institutions to uh, overcome some of these um, institutional cultural hurdles that are part of, uh, are still part of the academic system and specifically in the field of science and technology. Um, what are your plans um, as you move forward in, in your uh, strategic uh, 
um, development plans to uh, tackle this issue. Orla. Um, I might talk a little bit about our experience in Ireland, which I think has been very, very striking over recent years. So we have, let's see, we've, we've 14, thir sorry, 13 universities in Ireland. Some of them are very new. Um, and up until three years ago, we had never had a female president of any Irish university. Now we have seven female presidents of Irish universities. We have five new technological universities. Of those five, three are led by women. So, so we have affected a really dramatic turnaround in Ireland in terms of female leadership in higher education. So the question is, how, how did this happen? There are a number of reasons, but one of them was um, it, it became very politically embarrassing for us never to have had an Irish woman president. We did a government minister a few years ago who was very, very um, exercised by this and drew a lot of attention to it. And we introduced something in Ireland called the Athena Swan process. Now, you may know of this. I'll just describe it briefly for those who don't know it. It's a process that came out of the UK. So it's an accreditation process. So universities apply for accreditation at institutional level and then at departmental level for their activities around gender balance and working towards better gender balance. So all Irish universities had to get Athena Swan accreditation. If we did not, then we would not be eligible for research funding. OK, so that was that was a very, very important stick, if you like, for us in the Irish system. But even apart from the stick, you know, we, we all knew that we needed to do better and we wanted to do better. So the Athena Swan process and I chaired our first two Athena Swan uh, accreditation processes. Uh, so it's a, it's a cycle of about three or four years where you apply for an award, you get the award and then you have to reapply. So um, you have to come up with a self-assessment report that, you know, scrutinizes all the data, sees how you are doing well and how you're doing badly in terms of uh, gender representation in your institution. You then have to come up with an action plan. So a set of actions that are very much linked to the data. So you analyze your data. From that, you say, here is where we need to take action. You come up with a plan where the actions are very specifically described. They have timelines associated with them. They have owners associated with them. And that process has, has proved to be really, really important and successful for us in the Irish system. Um, because I, I'm always struck by a comment made by an American researcher, Virginia Vallian, about gender issues, where she says mountains are made up of molehills piled one on top of another. So if you can address all the small issues that, that limit female success in an institution, all of a sudden you find you've done something very, very big. So we've done a lot of things about, for example, all our decision making committees have to have at least 40 percent representation of both men and, and of women. Um, we have targets in promotion for women. We have set core hours so that the big decision making meetings can only happen between hours that do not overlap with childcare responsibilities. We've taken very significant steps around bullying and harassment. We've put in a big new uh, service around support in, in, in terms of dignity and, and respect in the workplace. So we've done lots and lots based on our action plan. We've come up with lots and lots of separate steps to address the issues that, that, that are experienced by women. And we've seen real transformational change. So, so when I joined our management team, for example, of about 13 individuals, there was one other woman alongside myself. There's now more than 50% women on the university management team. For many years, I was the only woman on the academic staff of engineering in UCD. Now, three of our five engineering schools are headed by women. The, the College of Engineering and Architecture is headed by a woman. We have women at all levels. So bit by bit by bit, by following specific actions in an action plan, we have affected real change in our institution. And for me as president, it will be a question of continuing that. First of all, continuing to prioritize this, making it clear through my visible actions, through my language, through how I spend my time, that this is so important for us as a university, because better diversity makes us a better university in every respect. So continue to support specific actions um, that uh, continue to measure how we're doing and make, take action where we are not doing as well as we should. And also, although I know it's not our, our, our core topic here today, recognize that diversity goes well beyond gender. So to look at all the other forms of diversity and make sure that we are doing what we need to do in all those other forms of diversity also. 
So you basically implemented the gender and equality uh, plan before it became mandatory for the European Union. And it's, it's Be yes, expensive. because it became mandatory in Ireland before it became mandatory yep. in Europe. Yes. Mm -hmm. And did you have a backlash inside the university? Were there any uh, implementing the plan? Were there hurdles to film amongst the community? Um, mm -hmm. uh, nothing. Th there was no very overt backlash yet. Yeah, there were some negative comments. You know, why are we spending so much time and energy on this? Um, one backlash, if you like, to it, that I actually agree with is that in implementing the action plan, so this is a lot of work, okay, coming up with this self-assessment document, the action plan, implementing the actions, it's a lot of work. Very often the work falls disproportionately on the shoulders of women and very often early career women and because they are often the ones who are most interested in this, most you know, fired up by this, and they put their hands up to take on this work or others are very happy to point to them to take on this work. Now that is unacceptable and, and, and counterproductive. You know, if we, if we are generating a lot of work for the institution and it all falls on the shoulders of enthusiastic early career women, that is, that is, not, that is not a successful story. So it's, it's not so much a backlash, but it is, you know, a, a problem that I have encountered with the implementation of our action plan that it draws too heavily on those really committed individuals, most of them women, we really need to draw on men, we need to draw on senior men, we need to draw on senior women, we need to draw on all parts of our community in order to deliver success. We also need to think the Athena Swan was very focused on academic career progression. But of course, in our institutions, the progression of, of technical staff, of, of research support staff, of all the administrative staff, that is also really key to our success as institutions. So again, there's been a little bit of you know, commentary that this is too focused on academic careers, and we need to, to reflect the, the totality of all the careers in our institution. So then, what is your plan? Okay, uh, actually, you know, the number speaks, you know, when I become the rector of Cadillac University, what I found is that, I want to give you the numbers, when we start, we start even in better position. The percentage of assistant professors, 60% female assistant professor, uh, the associate professor, 51%, and the full professor, 30%. 30, 30%. You know, we are losing women scientists along the way. When we start, we start even in the better numbers. What is happening in between is when they decide, you know, to have a family. And, you know, when I become the rector, that I was looking for a wise sector, female wise sector, and then I make offer, you know what, what answer I get? I can't accept it because I have full responsibility for my family. But when I make an offer to a man, I never get such an answer. This is cultural problem. I cannot change it. But if you want to, you know, if you want to increase the number of administrative upper level administrative women, the only thing that we have to increase the size of women professor pool. If you have 30% of the pool, you will have less choices. If you have 50%, this is, and today the number I'm working, you know, as Orla did, what we said, I said, okay, experience work. Because after I gain experience as the vice director, then I decided I can become director of a university. I have a clear policy for a university and I need to, I have, I need the power to implement my policies. Okay, so then how are we gonna increase the experience? I said, number one rule, each committee within the university will have 50% representation of our women faculty. And the head of departments, and I pay attention to the, the you know, choose on, on the deans. And then once you increase this number, they will gain the experience. And as I said, as a scientist, we are really good observer. And they will have the experience and then they will, in, they will want to do. They want to do that. This is and now what I did when I worked uh, in in 2022 numbers: assistant professors 64 percent from 60 to 64, associate professor it decreased from 51 to 50. Why? Because they become professors now. Professors 37 percent of our professors are female. So number job number one job is to increase. And what else I did? 
you know, uh, I put a rule. I said, no one can stay in one position more than seven years. When they are assistant professor, you talk to them, I want you to become associate and the full professor, but you have to also satisfy the requirements. And the answer I get, no, I am okay with it. And I said, I'm not okay with it because we have to increase the number of full professor, female full professor. So what will we also put to supporting mechanism? If they don't know how to write research proposal, how to write a scientific paper, we will provide all the supporting it. We did, and that's why now the numbers will increase. So yes, maybe those are easy, but there are also cultural problems. I don't know how I can change it. We cannot change it, but you know, we are at the right time. Now, if you can, if you want to make a change in this time, men, they are ready. They accept it. They don't, you know, get, you know, I'll do it with you. They are, okay, it's time to make some changes in gender equalities. It's the best time to make any arrangement uh, within the academia. So what I did first increase the number of full professor, female professors so that they can be candidate for the dean positions or the vice president and the president position and make sure they gain the experience. The experience I gained is important, was important. So let them have this experience and also give them the supporting mechanism because I really don't understand why forming family is the responsibility of women. I don't understand that. They just give up. And this is, a, I mean, in our culture, I don't know, it's the same, I think, in Western culture too. So there is nothing we can do about it. There is something. We can be a good role models. I have, every, each one of probably have the family. I have my own family. It wasn't, it wasn't easy, that's for sure. Keeping the family together and going along your career path wasn't easy. But still, I took the God. And we should set examples for the ones who are just looking at us. That's true. And um, why that, that's a cultural aspect of um, having families are the affair of all genders, not, uh, not simply women, all genders, yes, all so the partners in, in, in the situation they find themselves. And it is, it is a... a, a um, uh, uh, an issue that uh, uh, limits precisely uh, and, and justifies this uh, 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 leaky pipeline that you were also referring to. Um, Geraldine, you came into TU uh, right after uh, having this uh, tenure at Charité with the pandemia, very tough times and very tough times also for early career researchers and female researchers pursuing uh, their, their, their goals, meeting the research uh, targets. Um, how do you feel that uh, this experience impacted or not uh, your uh, strategy for TU and your strategy for the development of the university? How this experience of the, the hurdles that uh, some of the younger researchers well, well, I think uh, your question perfectly fits together with, with what we have discussed or heard before about cultural change, because um, I, I'm now for one year in as a president with my with my team. And the thing about cultural change and diversity also has a lot to do with my experience from the times before, like being a team leader, a young team leader, how we are expect, uh, expect um, I could help people um, Take you serious, yes or no? Because I was at the at the medical um, hospital before, and there the hierarchies are even I think much stronger than I have them here at the technical university. Because in, in medicine you have a very patriotic system. I think it's um, very hierarchically, and so you really have to be some kind of dominant to <laughs> to to take your place. And, but on the other hand, I I saw um, before, but also during the pandemic, and in the contrast in between that. Um, like leadership in every position and bringing people together or getting cultural change is so much about being empathic and bringing people together and listening to people and 
Um, this, of course, also has something to do with diversity. So these are not a specific um, um, measures you implement, but it's still something you think about. So for, for example, um, I have three vice presidents. One of them is not a professor, it's just an academic um, uh, uh, researcher. Um, one is a junior professor who is pregnant at the moment. <laughs> And um, in my office here, we are uh, five women, of which four have small children, me included. So um, this is, has something to do with the role model. But, I, but apart from this role model, I think it's also something which you take for normal and which is uh, like how you talk with people. And it's also something, I, I mean, if we talk about this cultural change, it's something how we um, appear as women in, in leadership or women in research in the media. So, so one thing I um, I didn't like when I became a president, of course, it was in the media because I'm the first woman and it's okay. And of course, they can ask me, but um, when they asked me, how do you feel as the first woman? Then I said, oh, I have never been something else but a woman. I don't know if I don't know how to feel if I wouldn't have been a woman. For me, it's like being a president. And why don't you ask me what are my plans as a president and not my plans as a woman? So uh, I, I'm not, I, of course, I like to be a role model or I like to uh, give courage to other people. But uh, in the first line, I'm there as a researcher and as having an agenda and as having ideas for people. and. I don't want to be reduced to be a young woman in a position of leadership. And this is also something very important because that tends to be um, men or other people who say, okay, she's only in this position because she's a young woman. That's the only, <laughs> that's the only thing she had. And we really have to take care that, um, of course, also a woman is not automatically a, a good leader, uh, but, uh, but it's the diversity who makes uh, the system good. So um, we are part of the diversity as uh, women are still underrepresented, but we also have to take care, for example, as, as we discussed before about structures, as you said, um, a university is not only guided by professors, it's also guided by the academic staff, by the non-academic staff, by the students. And um, well, I think for, for my career, it um, took a big part that I was uh, always on a very uh, same level as the students, like listening to them in the same position as I do to professors and I do not make too much changes in that. Um, and that also gives some kind like a um, cultural change. And the other thing is that um, coming from external, so I didn't knew how procedures were worked before at the TU of Berlin. I just did it my way, didn't ask too much how, how it was done before. And thereby, I didn't even always realize that I did it very differently, but people start after a while saying to me, okay, it's so differently to come to your office, for example, because before it, you have to make an appointment for months and then it was like, you have to be fully dressed to come in and you could really have to be prepared what to say. And for real, it's like being having open doors and it's so friendly. And I just, for example, changed the furniture to make it more friendly because it was, was very, hierarchically before it looks a little, little bit like a <laughs> king's office um, and this is also I, I mean of course it's not about furniture but it's like um, welcoming people and um, making them feel uh, at home or making them feel at the right place and giving them the feeling that somebody is listening and this is something um, which of course you cannot um, implement with, with a single uh, with a single message but you have to throw it over several people. And we are in fact doing many, many things about communication and information. So we have, which is in fact, not even a research plan or a teaching plan, but it's, it tries to bring people more and more together. And to, to come back to your uh, initial question, I think, um, I, I mean, I think bringing people together is generally very important, but especially uh, last year after the corona uh, pandemic, it was, it was really um, the people were uh, longing for meeting each other again and for uh, looking into faces and for touching people and for being there. And um, it's not all about digital meetings. <laughs> you really have to have a contact and to know, okay, she's really listening. It's not just an email. Um, and I think therefore it was a time where this cultural change and communication really had a even more or even higher impact than it generally has. 
We are very much looking forward to the Evora conference it, live in person in Istanbul. Yes, precisely for 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 that uh, for that reason. Yes, um, we have questions from our uh, um, the participants in the webinar. So I'm going to uh, uh, lay out the first two that have to do with some more strategic institutional uh, issues, um, and I'll give you the, the the two questions and then ask you. Uh, to, to answer freely. So the first one uh, is whether as a rector, uh, what are your priorities? What do you consider most the most important domain for you to be influential? I suppose in the academic, in the, um, uh, in the institutional structure. Uh, and the question then uh, lays out, is it finance the most important thing? Is it ICT? Is it uh, real estate, HR? So where would you put your most, most of your aches, let's say, in, in your development. And the second one, uh, also linked to this, uh, to, to this uh, question, uh, what are the three most important factors to, be, um, to steer the university in the right direction? So two very uh, uh, structured questions. I would start with Sondan. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Isabel. Um... Uh, what I am the most important thing, I want to create a research ecosystem. The university is a place where you do research and, of course, disseminate the world knowledge to, to the society. So, my first part is not, it, it wasn't the finance, it wasn't the HR. Uh, the first thing I said, what can I do to support the faculty members so that they can be a real researcher? That was the first priority. In five years, we succeeded. And now it became a research-oriented university. Then, of course, finance come. You have to provide all the finance for your institution to go survive. And now we're going to find a solution to this problem, too. And the, the culture, the, the, the top priority of my administration is the culture, changing the culture. Provide the equal opportunity to all faculty members, all students, and no distinction between the student and the faculty members. They can work together so that they can, you know, do whatever, work on whatever research questions they have in their mind. So, uh, it, 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 so the top priority is changing the culture within the university. So three most important thing to manage the university. First, the rector or the candidate should have a clear pathway for a university, okay? A definition of the university and a clear pathway to reach out this goal. Second, the rector should work 24 hours in a day. If you want to realize your goals, you have to work very hard so that you can, you know, you, you are the leader of the institution. So you have the pathway. So you just delegate the things to your uh, vice president, vice rectors and the deans, but you have to uh, really work hard. And third, as Gerald said, you have to have open door policies. Look, I have a gene now, you don't see it. And just his, his t shirts, this is how I work within the university so that the student can get in touch with me. And so that I show my faculty member that there is no differences between you and me. I'm just a rector. The academic title is professor. No, no, you come. There is an open door policy. You know, before me, no one would enter the, the building where you, I have an office. This is crazy. We, from whom I am scared? This is a new university. There shouldn't be any differences between the student and the faculty members. So you have an open door policy. Communication is very important. If you have goal for any, any institution, you know, your dream has to be dream of your faculty member, your staff, your administrative staff, your academic staff, your students. You have to work together. So for that, 
have an op open line for communication, open their policies, have a clear pathway for your dream, and you have to work very hard. Those are three important things for you to become a lecturer, I would say. I don't want to call it successful because success is an abstract story. I am not after, you know, uh, to become a success. No, no, I am happy. When I am going to be successful when I see a university that the administrative staff, the faculty members, students who are, are happy working in this institution. Geraldine, what's your take? Mm -hmm. um, I really enjoyed your talk. I just said that you were really speaking from my heart because I could repeat that. So I wouldn't do that, but I fully agree. <laughs> um, and uh, just to add some aspects, because I think at universities and uh, we are very much um, in competition all the time. And also the financial system um, pushes us to a, a competition all the time. And uh, media and all the people are only talking about our scientific uh, lighthouse projects. But in fact, we, um, I think, uh, at my, my, my university, but I, I can say that for most uh, German universities, this holds true, and I suppose uh, across the boundaries of Germany as well, that the infrastructure, like um, the, uh, the payment uh, role, uh, the social system, the uh, administrative um, infrastructure, like digitalization, like the the infrastructure uh, concerning buildings and all that is really has major drawbacks and major problems and nobody really sees them and no really really invests in them. So we have a system where professors can have uh, huge salaries because uh, they had uh, successful uh, research areas. And uh, I mean, that's fine. But what is not fine is that we are in a way, doing it on the on the back of uh, people who are in the academic uh, in between, or also of, uh, in back, on the back of the administrative stuff, where we sometimes ha have regularities where we really discuss months to give a person who really gives us the administrative backbone to give him I don't know 100 euros more per month. This, we cannot do that, or everybody says this is impossible. But on the other hand, we spend so much resources like. Um, uh, supporting people who already have a lot of money and uh, I think this system can no longer has no solid basis anymore we have to come back more together because also research and good teaching needs a good infrastructure and with a good infrastructure I mean that we have a social politics in university where every people uh, all the people can uh, earn fair, fair money and can live from their work and um, that also like um of course, we have lighthouse projects, and I don't want to be against it. But of course, we have also research, which takes uh, decades to have an impact uh, on society. But still, we need it. I mean, right now, we are talking much about climate change, but this is not a new topic. And the things we are um, uh, doing research on, like uh, right now, we will not have major impacts in a few, mo a few months. We will have to do it constantly and not by, okay, we give some money for the next two years and if we don't see any lighthouse success, then it's gone again. So I think we really have to make this a more solid fundament in, in terms of education, in terms of research. And uh, what you said also, it's very important because what is in academic careers, we tend to only look at the research. But we are um, universities, we are about education. So the students are one of the major roles. There are no universities uh, without students. So we really have to live it together because this are our next generations. And we, we cannot do something on the, on the back of uh, students or administrative staff. Um, we have to do it together. And therefore, I think it's perfectly the, 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 the correct position if you say it's, it doesn't matter if I'm a professor. I start to, uh, in Germany, you can say, <laughs> Uh, do or see. So um, <laughs> um, I, I um, propose the do to everyone, starting from students to professors. And this is uh, something very new because suddenly uh, everybody in, in our Senate is uh, saying do, <laughs> which was never done before. Um, and I really, I really want that people ask me and that don't feel, oh, this is the president. So, um, and uh, well, for me, it's like standing together that everybody helps each other and that we don't see only our own interests, but also the interests of other people at our university because we are a system 
who can only survive and only produce input for the society if we really work together. And I think during the last years, we focus too much on competition and professors and high rank professors and high rank publications. And uh, what I would do is a consolidation towards uh, a good social infrastructure and people being um, fair, <laughs> fair trade. <laughs> so, yeah, so this would be my impact. And the University Alliance, mm -hmm. Alliance is uh, uh, an example of cooperation. Right? Yes, In, definitely. Yeah. Orla. Your and approach. I, I, I'm so impressed by the answers that I just heard from my colleagues here, and I agree with all that has been said. You know, it, culture. You know, it, it's so important for a rector or president to set, set and, and live the culture for the organisation. Communication. You know, communication within the organisation to make sure everybody understands what, what is happening, and making sure that that you get the best out of all of your faculty, all of your administrative staff, you know, to really create an environment where people are empowered to be the best that they can be. I think that that is absolutely important. Part of that, of course, is infrastructure, making sure that the organization infrastructurally is robust and sound. And part of that, in turn, is the financial underpinning. So again, a, a, as a president of an institution, it is so important to, to have the appropriate financial robustness and health for the organization. And part of that is making the case for that financial support to our stakeholders, to taxpayers, to government, to the public, to, to, to make it very clear uh, why we are worthy of support, because nobody can take this for granted. Um, Geraldine's point also about breaking down artificial divisions or silos within organisations. Again, everybody in an organisation lives in, in some compartment. The president is, I suppose, ultimately where these all join up. So, so making sure that the organization is functioning as a whole, that people are not pursuing their own individual area, but that they are thinking in terms of how the university as a whole works and that our structures, our strategies, our, our, our communica communication pathways, our planning is joined up to make things function a, a, as a whole. So they're all, all what I heard from colleagues and I, and, and I completely agree with just another couple of things that I would emphasize and um, the role of the president in handling external relationships, I think, is really important and bringing the story of the organization out to a variety of, of audiences and stakeholders. I think that is really important. The president, in some sense, carries the institution with them, you, you know, into every room and every discussion that they're in. So they have to somehow convey the, 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 the personality, the strength of the of the institution in all their interactions. And then a final one that I'll mention is that we are going through such an extraordinary time of disruption. Now, may, maybe it's always like this. Maybe life is always disruptive in, in universities. And I guess that's true to an extent. But I think particularly now when we see the pace of technological change and new technological changes to do with big data, to do with artificial intelligence and machine learning that are upon us, that will change the workplace for our, our students and our graduates over the coming decades in, in ways that we can't even comprehend now. So we are somehow sitting at the vanguard of this. We are educating, first of all, the, the, the researchers who are looking into these areas are, are in many cases within our institutions, but also we are educating those who will be working and living in societies, working in the economies over the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So, you know, how do we plan to, to, to educate citizens and, and, and graduates who are empowered and, and you know, able to, to cope with this very, very disruptive times, the disruption of, of sustainability, of climate change as well as, of course, another enormous one. We have a very, very major responsibility through our research, through our education, through how we run ourselves as major organizations to make sure that we are responding to the imperative of sustainability. So, um, so again, you've heard so many tasks that rectors have to take on. It, 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 it conveys, I think, both the excitement and also the challenge of these roles. Precisely on that note, um, questions on diversity have come up on, the, on our board. Um, in the wider uh, sense of the term, uh, so the next two questions, one is specific, specifically related to issues of um, uh, maternity, uh, whether career promotion mechanisms include and are adjusted to questions related to maternity leave. And another one, uh, what would you want to see changed at your university, in your country, on a European level to develop diversity further? And I would start now with 
Geraldine. Well, um, some as things had already said before. I mean, of, on the one hand, uh, I see that many efforts are already made, um, as a, not not just starting from a, from a female president for diversity and, and gender equality, um, <laughs> but 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 still, it's like. Uh, for example, pregnancy or pregnancy is, uh, as you said before, it's uh, more fixed to women and um, women tend to be ashamed that, I don't know, they cannot do full-time job or they are away or they have an afternoon where they're not available. And um, I think it just has to become normal that we do it and then it, um, uh, then it's okay. And if we really see that people um, are judging on that, of course, it's our role as leaders to interrupt that and to give a clear statement but most of the time if people are just doing it or um, having the courage to just say okay i'm a i'm a i'm a mother i have to go home now uh, my, my kita is clothing and <laughs> um, then people do accept it uh, um and what what we can do is of course encourage them to uh, just to just simply do it for example, at our university, we have um, a, a very uh, we have a rule for a mobile work, which uh, includes forty percent of your working time can be uh, done in a mobile way. This has been um, implemented just after Corona uh, pandemic. It's not always easy because it also has challenges, like some people never meet each other. But uh, on the other hand, it makes uh, things easier, especially for uh, for families and. Of course, not only for women, also also for men. So, um, and yes, of course, we also have to um, have to give um, the, the the needs like um, family support, kids care, child care. Um, we we really have to uh, to, to uh, see and ask where uh, where the needs are and where we can support. This is often not something you can solve as a university alone. For example, at Berlin, it's very difficult to find childcare, permanent childcare, and this is nothing you can change as a university by yourself. But it, of course, you can bring it to the top. You can try to um, support, and you can all, you also, um, as a leader, has a position that people are going to ask you also in the media. So we so we have a much higher impact on on the society and on politics. Than I don't know an academic staff um, who is not finding childcare. <laughs> um, so for me, it's like living diversity and saying it's normal that we are diverse. And if something has never happened before, then uh, it's good that it happens right now. <laughs> so uh, we really have to uh, celebrate it. And what I uh, personally feel is that people, I, people really. Um, love it if you do it. I have got many, many feedback where people said it's it's so nice that you do it differently. It's so nice that um, we have don't have to care about that anymore. And um, well, so so I think it's again going back to cultural change. And of course, cultural change is like um, somebody starts, somebody else is uh, adapting, and then it's um, it's crossing. So it takes a little time, um, but it's. Our position to start it, and um, as I heard you here in the road, I think we all already started. So this is very nice. <laughs> Orla, uh, in terms of maternity leave, so the specific question of, of whether that is taken into account and things like promotions for us, absolutely yes. So there's a, a section in the form where you can indicate if you've had maternity leave or carers leave of any kind or any other special circumstances that might have interrupted your progression so that that can be taken into account when people are assessing your record. As part of our gender equality action plan, then we introduced more recently that people returning from maternity leave get to take a, a semester without any teaching responsibility so that they get to bring their, their career, back, their, their research back up on track. So to try to put in place those practical steps and those steps are not just for the universities ourselves. So for example, uh, one of our, our, our major national funders has just uh, introduced us in the process of introducing a policy where researchers who are attending conferences or undertaking research travel based off one of the research grants, they're able to charge certain childcare expenses associated with the travel to the grant. 
So again, this is this is new and it's, I think, a really interesting and positive initiative. So, so the fact that we are starting to see people take these steps, it's not just about the universities ourselves, it's also about the ecosystem in which we operate, of, of the European Commission, of national funders, of government, of, you know, stakeholders in various ways. And as Geraldine has said, to, to normalise this, you know, I, I, I took, I, I worked part time when my old children were very young, it was one of the most important things I did in my own career. I, my children are older now, but if I ever have to, say, leave a meeting early for family reasons, I never have any difficulty saying that this is what is happening so that everybody knows that this is normal and it is to be expected and that it is something that everybody should feel free to do as and when it is necessary. Thank you, Ensign Dan. You have to unmute. You have to unmute. <laughs> Sorry. OK. Uh, we are doing the same thing as always doing at the University of College Dublin. You know, yes, the maternity leave, when they're on maternity leave, the women, they are out of the performance system. When they come back, we give them another year so that they can get used to, you know, doing research again. And another thing with it, you know, at Kadiras University, we have a science award, yearly given science award. When for young scientists, the upper limit is 48, but for if it is women, we put 42 years because during the, along the way they can be they can they can have a child, so they are they are already living two years behind the man. This is what us also we put and also. For example, as I said in the beginning, I want all female assistant professor, uh, associate professor to be promoted. So we put a limit of seven years. If you have a maternity leave during this time, we had another two years. So the seven years goes to nine years. Um, you know, uh, extending the diversity, I think as a university, we have to get in touch with the society more deeply. Diversity is not just within the university. We have to know the diversity within the society. So you get to touch it, touch with the high school student, with the every segment of the societies that will show you where to work on within the society. Uh, we have disadvantages groups. So for those disadvantaged groups, we you know, we can you know design a fellow, and we are doing it at Kadira University. We are designing fellowship programs, scholarship programs for those uh, girl, the dad or girls of disadvantaged uh, families, and so that they can have this you know education um, in, in higher you know they can otherwise they could they can, they could do. So these kind of things we are doing, we are having, you know, summer school for high school students. We are getting together with the high school students and we can, we are getting in touch with the girls in high schools. This is important. And so my solution to that, uh, get in touch with the society, see the problem in the society because the universe is the reflections of the society. And we are an elite group within the academia. So we think that everything is just within the boundaries of our room. No, it is not like that. Get into the society, see the problems, and have some sort of solution so that you can. And internalization is another diversity in the universities. You know, having students with different backgrounds is really important. And, and that will create a tolerance working with uh, people with the different uh, cultural backgrounds. So there are many, many things to do within the institution to extend the diversity in the university. Now, two questions on leadership, one perhaps a little bit provocative. Uh, the first one on uh, leadership training for women. Uh, are there any specific uh, programs uh, at your universities targeting leadership development for women? And is female leadership of a university really distinct from male? <laughs> Orla. <laughs> um, the easy one first. Uh, yes, we do have leadership development programs for women in our institution, a program called Aurora, which is for early to mid-career women. I, I, and it's based around mentorship and also about certain forms of, you know, master classes that, 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 that those on the program take. I've mentored a couple of women onto the program who've gone on to, to you know, big steps in their career as a consequence. So, yes, I, these programs can really deliver impact. And um, is, is female leadership different from male? 
come back to my university in a few years time uh, because there, we're just about to have our first female leader. Maybe we'll know a little bit more then. It, it is certainly the case that, you know, a university that was led entirely by women and always by women, that would be as problematic as one led entirely and always by male. So it, for me, it's all about diversity of experience, diversity of personality around the leadership table. You need the, the, the people who come up with ideas. You need the implementers. You need the, the, the regulators. You need empathy you, you you need pragmatism you know you need all these different and complementary skill sets and having a, a balance of genders makes you much more likely i think to get both um but i'll tell you one place where, where, where female leadership is very distinctly different from male is in that role model aspect and i think i was under i i did not fully appreciate what a difference that makes particularly to early career women academics you know i've had so many early career women from both within and outside my own institution come up to me and say, you know, wonderful, you're president, I'm so inspired by what you've done, which is, you know, your immediate reaction or my immediate reaction is to somehow deflect and so on and be slightly embarrassed by it. But it is real, you know, that that role model thing, we, we you know, we, we often quote that, you know, if you can't see it, you can't be it. So, you know, to, for, for people to see People like them, people who have young children like they do, people who have been through the same kind of formative experiences they have, to see people like them taking on challenging leadership roles and, and thriving, it's so important for, for people. So, so I think that's one aspect of female leadership that is very clearly and, and unreservedly different from male le leadership is the ability to deliver that role model uh, to, to young women earlier in the career pipeline. So now. Is it that different? Unmute, unmute. <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry. Yeah, we don't have a specific program for women leadership at Cadillac University. I think we took the natural path. So uh, let them be part of the system. And through the experience, we can, uh, we can uh, show them that they can be dean or vice rector and director. Uh, in terms of uh, the role model, I agree with Aura. I just want to give you some number. You know, in you know, I become rector of Cadillac in 2018. The ratio of female and male students, 50% of the, it was 50%, 50%. Now it is 58% female students and 42% male students. It's, and also I go and visit the high schools. There, when you talk to them, the, when they see that a, a female, a woman can be director or in you know, upper position, and they see, and then they can set a goal for themselves. That is really important. Uh, and to increase, I really do not know how the numbers is increasing. I mean, the only thing that has changed is just, we have a woman director at Kadiras University. Yes, I am the first, Women rector at Cadillac University. Yes, women at female rectorship can make a change in the institution. And I agree with all of you. Look, last month we have an earthquake in Turkey. The response of, I mean, I felt in my ear. I mean, and then you are mother and you are everything, and your reaction to this is different. And as an institution, we organized, we, we did our best. We have, we tried to reach our students who are, who were in that region, uh, try to reach our graduate, try to reach our staff and everything. We did this well. So our response is different because we are more women, I suppose. And we bring the humanity to the administration. And that is what makes women leadership in the institution different. And to wrap up the discussion, Geraldine. Um, thank you very much. I mean, it's, we have to uh, talk so much about diversity and now the question is a little bit about giving um, like uh, uh, mean or average values about men and women. So on one hand I have, it's difficult because I think there are are men, many different men, there are many different women, and there's not this one style where you can say uh, president, female presidents do it in this and that way. 
but um I, I, I mean, we have some uh, trends which you cannot only see at universities that um, like, like you said before, that um, uh, social aspects and empathy and uh, social connections, communication are skills which are on average, let's really um, <laughs> pronounce that it's on average, uh, more um, dedicated to women than on average to men. So this has pros and cons, of course, because as you said before, it's not like uh, if we would always have and only have women in leadership, uh, we also uh, we also need other skills which are more or on average more depicted to men, like being pragmatic or more, um, I don't know, uh, more um, objective or, or whatever you could say. And please, <laughs> please don't cite me in a way that I would say these stereotypes always exist. So, but um, I I, uh, I really feel that also from this experience now in this round that um, we have been asked about diversity, but we have been talked about a lot of social aspects. And this is something very, very special. And um, if uh, I am in some rounds with other presidents from Berlin or other presidents from Germany, I see that uh, these aspects are on average more implemented by women. and. Um, it's a good mixture if we are um, have equal women and uh, men in leadership because then we should have a good mixture. And of course, as you said before, it's not only about uh, uh, female and men. Of course, we have other genders and we have other diversity aspects which uh, bring similar uh, things in. Of course, we also have different cultural backgrounds and all that. Um, uh, but I think you can observe it that uh, there are this diversity really brings new aspects in. And the social uh, the social component is something which I feel is very important. And I'm happy to see it in this round with women. <laughs> if it's quadrant related, <laughs> I don't want to say it, but uh, it's, I think it's a very important aspect. And I'm very happy that in this round, uh, also we don't know each other before and we come from very different parts of the earth. Uh, we, it seems for me like we are somehow connected in our um, uh, inspiration. Thank you very much, Geraldine, and thank you all. I think time uh, is, uh, you know, the, is 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 really uh, uh, um, upon us, and we have to to close the uh, this uh, discussion. I want to thank our three outstanding speakers today. We could stay here for the rest of the afternoon, perhaps today, sharing experiences and also learning from each other, because this is truly, uh, it is truly important to learn from the best practices and experiences uh, of uh, leadership that we have at our universities with the common mission of contributing to um, societies that uh, are better tasked to deal with the uh, um, hazards brought about by climate change, all the uncertainty, uh, social and ecological that is uh, affecting our world nowadays to contribute to also to democratic society. It is, it is extremely important, uh, especially in the daunting times uh, we are facing, uh, that university culture, its freedom and autonomy um, is um, um, uh, crucial to the advancement of uh, democratic cohesive societies. Um, I want to thank you for being such wonderful role models, thought leaders, and uh, for uh, contributing with your time to this uh, Evora uh, seminar. And I give the floor to our president, Ulsun. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to thank you all uh, as uh, the chair of the session, as the speakers of the, uh, this wonderful webinar. I don't know how to thank you all. This has been one of the most fruitful and enjoyable webinar, very useful one, very, very successful one uh, in the recent times that I joined. So I would like to thank you all and we should continue to share our experiences, our thoughts in order to make the life uh, our university life in our universities much better and more fruitful. 